it's Sarah here from BJC Health coming to you from Sydney, Australia. Uh, thanks for showing an interest in one of our educational events. You're about to watch part one. Um, so enjoy the event. If you've got any questions about the content, then please consider joining BJC Connect where you can access all of our facilitators live. Um, otherwise, please consider leaving a comment and we'll do our best to get back to you. Pretty hot topic for you today. We're talking about inflammatory back pain. So. Um, hopefully by the end of today, you'll have a good understanding of what we mean when we say that, and also some of the situations where you might be interested in getting referred or to check out whether this is something that might be relevant to you. Uh, it's nice to see everyone on the the um, nice to see everyone on the call today. Uh, it's always good to to hear from everyone about whether there's been any um, what sort of back pain or what sort of issues people have had individually. Have you had an injury? Do you have a condition, like an inflammatory condition? Some of the things we might speak about today. Uh, if you have, and if you have any comments, be good to pop it in the chat because it might help us to guide some of the things we can speak about today. So yeah. Okay, so I thought it'd be a good idea to cover a little bit of the anatomy of the, the back. Now, when we talk about the back today, we're going to be talking about the whole spinal column, which, as you can see on the left there, comes from the cervical, the neck, the thoracic or the rib cages, the lumbar, which is the lower back, and the sacrum and coccyx, which uh, it's an important area for us to understand the sacrum, that green one down the bottom there, and the joints where it attaches to the hip, which you call the sacred iliac joints, which might become relevant in some of the parts today. Uh, we also have uh, lots of different muscles, as you can see in the middle, that traverse right up from the top of our neck all the way down our back into the back of our hips and, um, you know, the joints down the bottom there. We also have the muscles that wrap around the middle. You guys have probably all heard about the core muscles, uh, and these are important for supporting the lower back and supporting the movement of the whole body. So I think it's nice just to have a bit of a picture as to um, what's happening in the area. So today we're going to be talking about inflammatory back pain, and I think it's important to differentiate from what we would consider mechanical lower back pain. And this is what we would normally think about the average back pain that most people would come in with, especially seeing a physiotherapist. Uh, and this could be something as simple as a strain when lifting, you know, you've lifted something a bit too heavy, or you've been doing a lot of extra things like gardening or moving places, so you're carrying a lot. It could be uh, sustained sitting or not moving enough. Um, if you've had a really long drive or you've been working a lot on the computer, you might start to feel a little bit of discomfort in your back. Or it could be starting a new activity, a new sport. So you could, might have started running, going to the gym, and you've just caused a little bit of strain to your body. Now, we think of this as potentially an overload. could be from weakness, lack of flexibility. These are the sort of things as a physio want to try and work out is contributing to someone's lower back pain. And typically, it's related to things like the muscles, could be a ligament or a strain, the discs you've probably all heard of, the joints, and even the nerves. Uh, it's also important to note that while we're talking about inflammatory and mechanical back pain, uh, it's not normally as simple as just, you know, calling it one or the other. There's normally a bit of a crossover between the two. So for those with what we consider mechanical back pain, there may also be some acute inflammation. So this could be if you, again, if you've had a muscle strain or you've strained some of the ligaments or joints in your back, you may have a bit of inflammation that comes about from that. Similarly, similarly if you've had a you know, sprained ankle or something, you're going to get a bit of swelling around it. Uh, inflammatory back pain, which Kate will talk about in a moment, can also have problems or restrictions from mechanical causes. So there can be the muscles, um, some of the joints, may lack flex flexibility and movement, which can also contribute or exacerbate people's inflammatory back pains. So I'll move on to talk about inflammatory back pain, but before then, do we have any questions about mechanical back pain in the... No, yeah, I think everyone's just easing in, Kate. It's really good. Keep going. <laughs> so Tim's talked about inflammatory back, uh, mechanical back pain for us, but inflammatory back pain is quite a different back pain to mechanical back pain. Inflammatory back pain is back pain that is caused by a fault in the immune system where the immune system is being overactive and it's causing inflammation in the spine. We call inflammation in the spine axial spondyloarthritis. I know that's a big word and there's lots of difficult words um, when we're looking at inflammatory back pain, but basically that means inflammation of the spine. Now, typically to make the diagnosis, we look at the lower spine for this, but generally people can get inflammation in any part of their spine. There are two distinct 
diseases within the axial spondyloarthritis within the inflammatory back pain group. But I look at them as more of a spectrum. It's not you have one or the other. It's you can have one and you can progress through sometimes. It's really the same underlying disease but different classification. So the first classification we have is called ankylosing spondylitis. So this is where you have inflammatory back pain and it's led to changes on X-rays. The other group is called non-radiographic axial spondylar arthritis. So it's a, it's a large mouthful. And this is when you have inflammatory back pain, but it hasn't led to changes on the X-rays, but you can see inflammation on the MRI. And in the next couple of slides, we'll go through a bit more about what is required to make those diagnoses. It's important to understand that since inflammatory back pain is a problem with the immune system, it can also affect other parts of the body apart from the back. We think of it as a whole body disease leading to inflammation of the back, but also it can involve other parts of the body, and we'll talk about that in a, in a few slides' time. This is a disease that usually starts in the 30s, and we'll talk a bit more about the features of inflammatory back pain shortly. But how common is inflammatory back pain? How many patients have it? Lots of patients have back pain throughout their lifetime. About 80% of adults will experience back pain at any time during their life. And generally 9% of the population will have back pain at any one time. Inflammatory back pain is a bit rarer, but it is still very common. So about one in 20 patients who have chronic back pain will actually have inflammatory back pain. It's an often under-recognized condition. And so we have also been doing education with our general practitioners to raise awareness of this condition because with so many people having back pain, it's important that we recognize inflammatory back pain as the treatment approach is very different. So it's about half to one and a half percent of the population will have inflammatory back pain during their lifetime. So it's quite a large percent. There is unfortunately quite a large delay in diagnosis of inflammatory back pain. And this is very important. So studies have shown up to five to 14 years of delay in diagnosis. And this is very common in the patients I see. Patients I see will have had back pain for many, many years before I see it. And it's been a delayed in diagnosis. They've often tried to seek help, but there hasn't been recognized that their back pain has inflammatory features. It is important that we make this diagnosis as early as possible because this is back pain that has treatment options and we can have we have very effective treatment options, which we'll go through in a couple of slides time. And this can really improve the symptoms that patients experience. It can also prevent any progression of these disease, the treatments that we have available. So if you have back pain, what are some features that would lead you to think that it could be inflammatory back pain? So Tim's already talked a little bit about mechanical back pain. Inflammatory back pain has quite a different presentation. So generally it starts early on life. We say before the age of 40, generally. The back pain has an insidious onset, so a gradual onset. With mechanical back pain, patients will often tell me, oh, I had an injury and then my back pain started. But with the inflammatory back pain, patients often tell me, oh, I've had back pain. Uh, it maybe started in my mid-20s and progressed from there. They can't pinpoint an exact time when it started. And that's a common feature of inflammatory back pain. Inflammatory back pain typically improves with exercise and movement, and there's no improvement with rest. This is important. When I see patients and take a history to determine if their back pain sounds inflammatory, they tell me that they often have pain that's waking them at night. They wake up due to their back pain. And it's in the morning, they wake up with a very stiff lower or other parts of their back as well. During the day, these patients often feel a little bit better. And they'll say, oh, while I'm at work and while I'm busy, I don't notice my back pain anymore. But that's, they're often busy and not noticing their back pain, but also inflammatory pain is generally better when you're moving. When you get things flowing, the pain improves, and that is a typical feature of inflammatory back pain, but also an inflammatory arthritis. So patients who have inflammation of their other joints that aren't involved in the back, they often feel better with exercise and worse when they rest. Inflammatory back pain also typically responds very well to anti-inflammatory medications. The most typical one patients will have is ibuprofen, so inflammatory back pain generally gets a lot better with anti-inflammatory medications, as opposed to mechanical back pain, which doesn't always get better with anti-inflammatory medications. I did mention that inflammatory back pain can be a multi-system disorder because it is the immune system, which is everywhere. And so there are a lot of features 
that can be associated with an inflammatory back pain disorder that we look out for. The same immune system dysregulation can often lead to psoriasis. So psoriasis is this rash that you can see on the, on the screen. It's a plaque-like rash, which pe patients often have on their elbows or their scalp. So these patients that have inflammatory, if they have back pain, I'll look for psoriasis on my patients as that is a hint that they might have inflammatory back pain. And about 30% of patients who have psoriasis can also have an inflammatory arthritis. So the immune system dysregulation leading to inflammation of other joints. So patients who have back pain can also have trouble with their other joints where their say, fingers, toes, large joints can feel stiff and sore in the morning and have joint swelling as well. A typical presentation is also enthesitis. So this is inflammation of where the ligaments and tendons insert into the bone. We typically see this in the Achilles tendon as shown in this picture here. For example, last year I had a patient present to me, their GP referred because they'd have bilateral Achilles tendon pain for many years and have been trying many different treatment approaches just to improve their Achilles tendon pain. They hadn't had large success and they had actually talked to a surgeon about having surgery, but their GP had referred them to me for a review first. And I took a history and this patient actually had inflammatory back pain and I did imaging and confirmed a diagnosis of ankylosing spondylitis and started treatment. He was most bothered actually by his Achilles tendon problems, but the treatment for the back improved all of the Achilles tendon problems. So it's important that we recognize that patients who have these other features, it's important you can ask about it as well. So if you're having trouble with your Achilles tendons or you have psoriasis and also have back pain, think about whether or not this pain could also be an inflammatory back pain. As part of psoriatic arthritis, some patients also get what we call dactylitis or sausage fingers and toes. <laughs> and that's in this picture here where one finger or toe becomes swollen because of inflammation of the tendons and the joints throughout that finger. So anyone who has back pain, I'll look for all of these other features. Psoriasis can also affect the nails, as you can see in the picture here as well. Patients who have inflammatory back pain often have a family history of other people in their family having inflammatory back pain. So if someone in your family has a diagnosis of inflammatory back pain and you also have back pain, it's important to get that checked out earlier. There are a few other associated features that you can see in patients who have inflammatory back pain just due to that immune system dysregulation. Patients are more prone to have inflammatory bowel disease so anyone who's also getting managed for inflammatory bowel disease, which is inflammation of the lining of the bowel caused by the immune system, they should. if they have back pain, it's important that you consider whether or not that back pain is inflammatory. So I, when I'm assessing my patients for inflammatory back pain, I always ask them, do you have any diarrhea? And if they do, I'll test for inflammatory bowel disease as well. The same genetic abnormality also um, predispose patients to getting inflammation of the eye. And so I always ask patients about this if they have back pain, if they've ever had inflammation of the eye. This is an important feature to recognize as it's actually a bit of an emergency because if you leave the inflammation going, it can damage the eye. When I was working up in Queensland, I was doing a, um, a quaternary clinic. So all the patients with inflammatory back pain came down for a review in our clinic. And I found about once a week, I was sending patients straight to the eye casualty because they had inflammation of their eye and it needed to be sorted out straight away. So anyone who thinks they have inflammatory back pain and has trouble, it presents with pain and redness of the eye, they should get that checked out quickly. And it can just be as easy as going to your optometrist at the shops because they should be able to do an examination and tell us there's inflammation in the eye. So there's actually quite a lot of associated features with inflammatory back pain that if you have any of these features that might be pointing towards the pain that you have in your back being of more of an inflammatory nature. But this is also important for any patients who have inflammatory back pain to be aware that these uh, this can also develop as well. Was there any questions about the associated features? Not yet, Kate. I think <laughs> a couple of questions, but I think keep going and we'll, um, yeah, you're doing great. <laughs> so for patients with inflammatory back pain, at university, when I went through university and I think more recently, patient, we were taught that inflammatory back pain typically presents in a male in their 30s with pain in their lower and thoracic spine. And so this has led to women being under-recognised for this condition. 
So while it's true that ankylosing spondylitis, so inflammatory back pain that has X-ray changes, is more common in males, the opposite is true for females for, for non-radiographic axial spondylar arthritis. So females are more likely to have that inflammatory back condition without X-ray changes. We don't really know why they're less likely to get X-ray changes, but we do know that they still have the similar symptom burden to the, um, the male patients, which are more often diagnosed earlier. Women typically present with more pain in their upper back and also pain in their other joints, such as the shoulders and hips. So this often leads to a delay in the diagnosis of inflammatory back pain in these patients, which is very unfortunate because of the treatment options that are available. So I have been working with the GPs to raise awareness, particularly around females with inflammatory back pain as well. So now I'll move on to how we make a diagnosis of, a, of back pain, of inflammatory back pain. So if I have a patient presenting to me with back pain, what will I do to try and determine if it's inflammatory back pain, an inflammatory condition that, require, that we have management options for? First, I'll take a, a thorough history, looking at those features of the back pain to determine if it does sound inflammatory or not. Then I'll, of course, look for those associated features. I'll do a careful examination, looking for those associated features, checking all of the different joints, looking quite thoroughly for rashes, checking the nails. Tim's going to go through in the next couple of slides about what in the back we specifically look for in the examination, but we do check the range of motion of the back. Then there are some blood tests that can provide us a hint whether or not the patient's pain is inflammatory. So there's a genetic marker called HLA-B27. So everyone has a HLA class and about 10% of the general population will have a HLA class, which is called B27. So not everyone who has this class will have inflammatory back pain, but it is a suggestion because about 80 to 95% of people who have ankylosing spondylitis will have this genetic marker. So it does predispose you to this condition. The, the um, percentage is a bit lower for those who don't have X-ray changes with about 75 to 85% of patients. And that is, again, more of our female patients, and we're not sure why. So even if you, if patients have inflammatory back pain and, and history that sounds inflammatory and the HLA B27 is negative, it's still important to get checked out because there's still a possibility of inflammatory back pain. Patients who have inflammatory back pain can have inflammation located just in the spine, but sometimes that does spill over into the blood and we can see that with raised inflammatory markers. And so what we look, the inflammatory markers we look for are the ESR and the CRP. So if patients have back pain with high inflammatory markers, this is just a bit of a suggestion that it might be inflammatory back pain. So if you're presented to your GP with back pain and you're concerned it might be inflammatory, it's a good idea to ask for these tests or hopefully the GP will run them for you. And so then once I've taken the history examination and done some blood tests, I'll usually order imaging at the same time. Generally, we start with some x-rays and depending on those changes, progress to an MRI if needed. So I'll go through some of the x-rays now. So what we do, so you can see changes of inflammatory back pain on x-rays of the lower spine, but also throughout the rest of the spine if it's advanced disease. For classification criteria and for to meet the criteria that the government sets out for certain treatments, we need to have made the diagnosis based on imaging of the lower back of the sacroiliac joints. So that's what Tim showed us uh, a picture of earlier in the presentation. Don't know if you can see my mouse or not. Can you, can you see the mouse? Yes, okay. So these are the sacroiliac joints here. They're the joints that join the spine, the sacrum, so the iliac joints, iliac bones, which are the bones of the pelvis. And so why inflammation occurs throughout the whole spine, it's more common to see it earlier in the disease here. So we x-rays can only detect structural changes, so changes in the bones that have occurred as a result of inflammation. They can't show inflammation at the time that the inflammation is there. So some hints that there's been previous inflammation is this extra white bit around the joints, which is called sclerosis. See this here? Generally, um, this can be a bit overcalled on the x-rays. We find x-ray grading is quite subjective, and if one person looks at it, they might look at it a little bit differently. We also can see widening of the joint space here. Sometimes we can see a few erosions of the joint space, 
And if the disease is advanced, you can see that the joint spaces can eventually become completely fused and eventually you won't see any joint spaces here. But hopefully we are picking up patients a lot earlier than this to prevent this from happening. So based on these changes, we give a grading to each of the joints and based on that grading, we can make a diagnosis of ankylosing spondylitis. But as I said before, some patients won't develop x-ray changes at all. About 50% of patients will develop x-ray changes. So not everyone does, and we're not sure why. So then if I have a patient who I still think has inflammatory back pain despite having a normal x-ray or having an x-ray that doesn't show grading quite as severe enough to make the diagnosis of ankylosing spondylitis, we go on to order an MRI. So here's an example of the MRI. MRIs are able to detect inflammation as it occurs in the, in the joint. Okay, they can show structural changes as well, like their x-rays, but also show the inflammation. So generally, if your GP or another physician has ordered an, an MRI of the spine, they include the lumbar spine, which is the area further up here. They don't always include the sacroiliac joints, unfortunately. So sometimes I'll have patients who've had an MRI, but they haven't included the right bit, which is a bit unfortunate. So this area here, we're looking for edema, bone marrow edema. So that's just swelling in the bone. So you can imagine if you had a cut on your skin with an infection, the skin would get a bit swollen. So we can see the same thing that's happening due to an immune system problem in the around the sacroiliac joints. So here you can see the increased whiteness on this on this scan, and here it's a bit darker. They're two different um different images based on different physics. And so this shows that there's inflammation of the bone. We need to make sure that that inflammation is around the joint margins and that the inflammation is big enough on enough slices of it as well. If you've had previous inflammation and it's resolved, it can lead to fatty infiltration of the bone. So that's what you can see on this side where it's a different color. You can also detect the erosions which you saw on the x-ray as well. Now, it's important that to know that some patients who don't have inflammatory back pain can have minor changes on MRIs. So not everyone who has a small amount of inflammation on the MRI will have an inflammatory back problem. Studies have shown that people who are runners, people in the army carrying packs, women who have given birth will also have a little bit of inflammation on the MRI. You don't want to overcall this disorder, but anyone who has what we call like large areas and multiple areas of inflammation, we would be enough to make the diagnosis of the non-radiographic axial spondyloarthritis as a cause of inflammatory back pain. Any questions about that before we move on to management? Yeah, I might um, pause here if that's cool, Kate. Um, yeah, there's a lot to take in. And I think this topic can, one of the reasons it can be tricky is also the words and the phrases we use the language isn't necessarily easy but anyway hopefully please everyone there's no question that's um yeah silly or yeah I know we've we've already covered quite a lot so one question was um and it might and Tim chime in for this too so someone's uh, I think as Evelyn asked you know when it's inflammatory back pain versus say more mechanical back pain is it likely to feel different so I know that might be hard to answer, but yeah, how would you describe how it might feel for a patient despite the features and some of the other stuff you went through? Yeah, in your experience, how do patients describe their inflammatory back pain versus some of the other types? I find patients who describe their mechanical back pain will have pain that's kind of a bit sharper. It's more with certain movements. It's come on quite suddenly as opposed to inflammatory back pain, which is more of a stiffness pain. And it has a different time course as well. So the back pain in the morning, it's a stiffness. It feels a bit better once you move around, get it a bit looser. That's The locations can also be a bit different because, of course, with mechanical back pain, you can also get the nerves involved. So it can go, you can get nerve pain down the leg. But inflammatory back pain can also present into the buttocks. So people often have pain in the buttocks as a cause of inflammatory back pain. So it, it can be very difficult to determine and often some further testing is needed. Tim, what do you think? Yeah, I tend to agree. Um, sometimes it's hard for people to differentiate based on how it feels. It's also very hard to describe because everyone's feeling is quite different to what they experience. I think those features, as you mentioned, where it's um, maybe the more around when people notice it, um, the pattern in the morning, overnight, 
um, how long the symptoms last, all those things are a bit more likely, I think, to give us information um, because it can be hard to differentiate when just talking about the feeling of it. Yeah. Awesome. Hopefully that helps, Evelyn. Um, and Mira's asked, so when you went through um, the inflammation of the eyes, Kate, mm -hmm. um, so you've talked about that in the context of back pain and inflammatory back pain, but if people have inflammation in other parts of the body, can they also get inflammation of the eye or how would you sort of describe that collection of things that you um, discussed earlier? So the inflammation people get in their eye is called uveitis. So it's inflammation of the anterior, what we call the anterior chamber, the clear bit that sits above in front of the iris, the colored bit of the eye. And so that can be caused by a few different reasons. But one of the common reasons is if they're HLA B27 positive and the immune system has caused it. There are a few other reasons. Of course, if you have eye inflammation that the eye doctors will generally look for, a few other immune system problems, it could be an infection as well. There's a few different other reasons, or it could be a more eye, like a specific eye-related problem. So it's important to, often we find patients who go to the ophthalmologist to get a workup for their eye inflammation. The ophthalmologist will find that they're HLA B27 positive and then refer to us for assessment of the back and other features because our management can also prevent people from getting recurrent problems with eye inflammation. As part of the workup with the ophthalmologist, they will also check for other causes of inflammation of the eye because different parts of the eye can get inflamed and it's quite a specific part of the eye that is inflamed in this condition. Gotcha. Um, and Mady's asked a couple of good questions. So <laughs> one was, um, if we don't have inflammation, why do we need your services? And I, I think I'm happy to tackle that one. So maybe that's a great question. Good on you for asking it um, because, yeah, I think um, the first step is trying to have a good feel as to what might be causing your pain. And so seeing someone like Kate, who's a rheumatologist, she is so helpful to help both yourself if you're a patient, um, understand what might be happening. And then if Kate's like, actually, um, this is an inflammatory back pain, then it's really her role to then help direct you to who might be able to help you with that. And so, yeah, Kate, I'm sure you have seen clients and then you haven't needed to see them again, right? Because you've yeah. done the best you can do for that person. Yeah, a large percentage of the patients I see for back pain won't often have inflammatory back pain and we can often try and figure out what is causing that other kind of back pain. And there are specific treatment approaches to depending on what that cause. If there's a, for example, if someone's having severe nerve pain that's taken a while to resolve, we might be able to do local injections. But of course, the first line therapy is often a referral to physiotherapists like Tim as well, giving you direction. If there's like a specific nerve involved, we can target that. If there's inflammation in a specific joint of the spine, sometimes we can target that and just giving reassurance and referral on. But we often, I'll see patients who don't have inflammatory back pain, give them some direction. And depending on what the other cause is, I might follow them up or, or we might um, follow up with our allied health team for ongoing management. Beautiful. Um, and Medi's second question was, um, yeah, how do we know if the pain's caused by spinal nerves or from inflammation? Um, yeah, Kate kind of went through its questioning. So both a rheumatologist, a physio, they've got to ask you a whole bunch of different questions about your experience so they can get some of the information and then they might do investigations as well. So I think that's a good question too because it's like, yeah, it's not always easy to figure this out on your own um, and sometimes it might present as one thing and then change down the track so um, knowing what questions to ask and which types of investigations to order that's really yeah Kate's job but um, that's why it's important I guess um, to do talks like this so that just more broadly more people know about it and then you can also take these sorts of questions to yeah who you might be working with to help you manage your pain um okay. the examination can also be very helpful the physical examination in patients mm -hmm. trying to different trying to determine if it's nerve pain or inflammatory back pain or more localized mechanical pain because often if patients are having nerve pain your examination will reveal a bit of an abnormality and something to target so hinting at which way it's to go and depending on how severe it is they can require different patients can require different therapies for the nerve pain as well Perfect. Um, and lastly, I thought um, this is another great question by Lise. Um, if we manage our inflammatory back pain well, does that mean we are less likely to develop associated conditions such as um, IBD and uveitis? 
Yes, what? definitely. Definitely. And we'll cover that more in the next couple of slides. Okay, beautiful. All right, good segue. On to you, Tim. On to management. <laughs> well, I was going to cover this slide. Oh, you keep going. Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> So if I've diagnosed a patient with inflammatory back pain, what do I then do with them? Of course, education is very important. Patients often like having a good explanation of what's causing the pain and why this has happened to them. I then refer to our friendly physiotherapist like Tim, who does a full assessment of the back. There is evidence in inflammatory back pain that an exercise program does slow the progression of the disease and prevent any deformity. So it's important that patients do participate in an exercise program. And often that is a few initial points with the physiotherapist, but also long-term commitment to doing it at home and then getting checking in regularly to see how they're progressing. The first line therapy is anti-inflammatory medications. So we often try a few different anti-inflammatory medications. Patients have often already tried ibuprofen, Nurofen. This is a short-acting medication, which only gives relief for a short period of time. There's lots of different options. So often we'll try a long-acting anti-inflammatory to try and get longer relief throughout the day. I find these long-acting anti-inflammatories are better if taken with dinner because that allows relief throughout the night and you to feel good in the morning because inflammatory back pain is typically worse at night and then the morning. Of course, we'll have to check for any other of those associated features. If patients, when they originally present to me, if they have something like an inflammatory arthritis, that will need to be managed separately at the start. So we have a bunch of different medications that modulate the immune system to try and stop them attacking attacking the joint. So managing an inflammatory arthritis like that psoriatic arthritis. Unfortunately, there's no evidence that these specific medications will actually change the back symptoms so at the first line, treatments often don't overlap, but eventually the treatments will overlap, as you'll see towards the end of the presentation. The anti-inflammatory medications can be helpful for those other features as well, such as the inflammatory back pain, but also the enthesitis, what we should talk about, the inflammation of the tendons and the pain in the other joints. Okay, If patients have bad psoriasis, that will often be managed separately at the start with topical therapy. If patients have inflammatory bowel disease, I, if they have features of inflammatory bowel disease, I'll generally get them to do a stool sample. And so that stool sample can tell us if there's any inflammation there. If their, feet, their presentation is concerning or that stool sample shows any inflammation, they will need to get a review with a gastroenterologist for a colonoscopy and biopsies to confirm the diagnosis. Inflammatory bowel disease can be quite severe and the management and the diagnosis need to be confirmed for long-term management and monitoring. Eventually, when we move on to second-line therapy for the back pain, that will manage the inflammatory bowel disease. And sometimes patients who are getting their inflammatory bowel disease managed by gastroenterologists, the treatment will also be the same and help with the back as well. The uveitis is a bit of an emergency, so it needs to be managed urgently with an ophthalmologist. The first line therapy is topical um, steroid drops in the eyes, and that that would that's quite long. You have to do that for a long term, but then eventually, if we're progressing therapy for the back, the therapies will prevent the recurrence of that disease, and you won't need those steroid drops anymore. Sometimes patients who don't have inflammatory back pain but have recurrence of the uveitis, the ophthalmologist will refer to us to help them start therapies to prevent recurrence inflammation of the eye with the same medications we use for the back pain. For our patients, it's important that we see them over time to see how the back pain is progressing. If their inflammatory markers are normal, we want to repeat them regularly to make sure the inflammation is well controlled and hasn't come back. Of course, I want to know if one of my patients who had their symptoms well controlled on anti-inflammatories, suddenly the anti-inflammatories aren't working and their inflammatory markers have gone up. We also need to monitor the mobility of the back because unfortunately, if this condition isn't managed properly, that the mobility of the back, so the ability, the flexibility of the back can be lost. And I think Tim's going to talk a bit more about this shortly. So you've just finished watching part one of one of our recent educational events. Hope you enjoyed the content. 
If you'd like to access part two, then you need to sign up for BJC Connect. It's a free platform where you can access not just the recordings of uh, past events, but also access a whole range of upcoming future events and access our team of facilitators live. Um, all of the details that you need to join BJC Connect are now flashing up on your screen. But otherwise, like our staff, subscribe if you'd like to see more information from BJC Health. Look forward to seeing you in an event soon.